Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, April 11th, 2021, is entitled, The Spirit's More. It's the last installment in our Grounded worship series, examining core concepts in our faith that shape what and how we believe. It's a reflection on a reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, 12, and 17 through 18. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to learn more about our open and affirming ministry at the Congregational Church of Needham, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Our scripture reading today comes from the New Testament, from the letters of the early church, from the second letter to the church at Corinth, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6, 12, and 17 through 18. Let's listen together for a living word from God in these words from 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are competent of ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, Our competence is from God, who has made us competent to be ministers of a new covenant, not of letter, but of spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Since then, we have such a hope, we act with great boldness. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, all of us are being transformed into the same image, the image of God, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, from the Spirit. Friends, God is still speaking to the world and to us. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. This Sunday is the last installment in our grounded worship series that we've been exploring over these last several Sundays, many Sundays stretching back through the season of Lent, a series where we've examined core concepts in our faith that shape what and how we believe. It may seem strange to end this series on the Holy Spirit. After all, we did not spend an entire Sunday each on the other two persons of the Trinity, the Creator and the Christ, though we easily could spend an entire series, in fact, an entire lifetime on either, or on the idea of the Trinity itself. But then of the three, the Holy Spirit is the one that usually gets shortchanged particularly in our historically so-called mainline Protestant denominational traditions. A note here to say that just as the word superstition is often used to refer to someone else's religion, mainline simply means those Christian traditions we ourselves know best and are most comfortable with. And though we would never put it so bluntly, I've observed that in these mainline traditions, we tend to take a very, I would call it, I would say American capitalist view of the Trinity. God the Father, and I'm using the masculine language here intentionally, God the Father is the CEO of the Trinity, Trinity Inc. Jesus the Son is vice president in charge of marketing and customer relations. And the Holy Spirit, Well, the spirit is kind of like the janitorial staff, nameless, faceless, working behind the scenes to clean up after everyone else and keep things running smoothly. We don't even know her name, 
And yes, the Holy Spirit is the only one of the three that has historically been gendered feminine. I mean, we know the divine is transgender, expressed in and beyond our limited and limiting binary ideas of gender. And yet still, still, the femme is left underdeveloped. The Holy Spirit is left holding the mop while the men get all the face time and all the credit. Thank goodness that's not the case in every denomination. There are traditions like Pentecostalism that center the divine presence and work of the Spirit, who preach and pray and praise the Spirit. But in the mainline schema within which we generally operate, those Christian traditions are themselves diminished along with her. They're painted with the same sexist brush that colors so much of the roots of our thinking in our middle and upper class white mindset, white American mindset, considered too irrational, too emotional, given to fits of what? Hysteria, literally from the Greek uterus troubles. But you know how those people do carry on. Sexist and racist. But the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is more. More than that. And just plain more. More, no period, no full stop, but more dot, dot, dot. While the Creator speaks to us from their throne in the past, impossibly remote, and the Christ seems trapped in the amber of their three years of earthly ministry, forever oscillating between Good Friday and Easter, the Holy Spirit is unbound, free and freeing, free to meet us here and now and to move us forward from here. Because so much of our Protestant Christianity seems to be about a desire to return, a desire to return to an idealized, platonically inflected past, as though pure perfection is a matter of reducing and restoring, reformed and reforming backward, always backward, to an imagined beginning, a beginning that we imagine ourselves having descended from a perfect church of Acts chapter 2, where everyone devotes themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, an early church where all the women were strong and all the men were good-looking and all the children were above average that likely never existed. We lament that we were born so late. Even the Apostle Paul lamented that he was born so late, that we don't know Jesus face to face, for surely then we would have understood him better, even better than his actual disciples did, and ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? When Jesus himself asks his disciples, and by extension asks us, his latter-day disciples, what will we do? What will we do, not there and then over 2,000 years ago, but here and now by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit? Now, the Gospel of John was written near the close of the first century after the death and resurrection of Jesus as the church that had been looking for the imminent return of Christ to usher them into paradise, as they began to come to terms with what was shaping up to be a rather extended delay. And so John's Jesus, as opposed to Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Jesus, John's Jesus spends a lot of private time with his disciples discussing the future. Whereas those other gospel communities wrote of the Last Supper as just one step on the road to the cross and beyond, John's gospel takes that brief scene and turns it into a lengthy after-dinner speech. Chapters 14, 15, 16, and 17 in John's gospel, a farewell address 
where repeatedly Jesus commends the Holy Spirit to his disciples and vice versa. They are to do not just what he himself did, but with the aid of the Spirit to do even more, to do even greater works, greater works than Jesus imagined. For I will ask the Father, Jesus says, who will give you another advocate to be with you forever, the spirit of truth, who will witness to what I have taught you and teach you everything else you need to know to navigate the world as a person shaped by trust in the divine, even as I myself am. A spirit who will provide us with a deeper, wiser alternative to the world's meager understanding of sin and righteousness and judgment. This Holy Spirit will be both comforter and challenger. In fact, Jesus said the Spirit will teach us things, important things, we cannot learn from Jesus himself. Imagine that. The Gospels written some 2,000 years ago do not cover every possible exigency, every possible thing we might encounter. The Spirit will teach us ways of believing that will steer our future in faith and the future of the world toward that abundant life that Jesus talked about. So when we shut out the Spirit, when we diminish our relationship with the Holy Spirit, when we limit her influence in our lives, not just in how we worship, but how we live day to day and make our decisions, look what we lose. Hope, as the Apostle Paul says in our reading from 2 Corinthians today, hope and the boldness to live into it. These are the gifts of the Spirit who is both the still small voice and the sound of a violent wind. The spirit who burns up the chaff and waters the good seed inside us. The spirit who upsets our apple carts and inspires us to build even better ones. The spirit whose action among us like living lightning in an instant starkly illuminates all our differences, all our diversity, and the, gaps, and the gaps in between us, and then, like a spark, leaping from dendrite to dendrite deep in our brains, bridges them, binding us together, creating unity of purpose without demanding uniformity of practice. The spirit of Pentecost, whom Moses encountered at the burning bush at Sinai, who sets our hearts on fire for the gospel of justice, peace, and compassion without demanding that we ourselves be consumed and burned up completely in the process. I'm reminded of a poem from Mary Oliver called appropriately, Lightning. The oaks shone gaunt gold on the lip of the storm before the wind rose. The shapeless mouth opened and began its five-hour howl. The lights went out fast. Branches sidled over the pitch of the roof, bounced into the yard that grew black within minutes, except for the lightning. The landscape bulging forth like a quick lesson in creating, then thudding away. Inside, as always, it was hard to tell fear from excitement. How sensual the lightning's poured stroke. And still, what a fire and a risk. As always, the body wants to hide, wants to flow toward it, strives to balance while fear shouts, excitement shouts back and forth, each bolt a burning river tearing like escape through the dark field of the other. which is to say, living in relationship with the Holy Spirit, leaning with her into a future that is not yet entirely revealed is a whole lot scarier than resting on the imagined laurels of the past or even simply drifting untethered through the present. It's scary for us, 
And it's scary for the world watching us try to do it because we've always done it this way or why bother at all? But both nostalgia and apathy are overrated and underperforming as life strategies. If our current situation as a nation, and if I may say, as a church, capital C church, is any proof. How can we hope to negotiate the curveballs that living in the real world, as Jesus did, constantly throws at us if we are constantly leaning backwards onto our back foot? How can we hope to move forward if we're struggling just to stand still while the world spins around us? The promise announced to us as followers in the way of Christ was never that we would endure unchanged, unfazed by life. Even stone statues crumble, just ask Ozymandias. Even roofs leak, just ask this building. But rather the promise is that we would live lives worth living whenever we lived that we would be changed in life-giving, love-giving ways, that we would, in fact, be transformed from one degree of glory to another and the world along with us. No, my friends, if we trust in the Holy Spirit, it is not a return to a once-upon-a-time Eden we're looking for. Those few of us who manage to hold on to the past properly and hold out against the demands of our ever-changing world but a journey to a paradise we have not seen, that we are building stone by living stone, step by living step, sometimes one step forward and two steps back in collaboration with God, dancing with the Holy Spirit, all of us, all together, and she is one heck of a dancer. The spirit of truth and freedom and comfort and challenge, and affirmation, and change, and grace. She's got moves we can scarce imagine. And that's the point. That's the point, isn't it? As our old familiar steps find us fumbling to find our footing in these days. If the past year has taught us anything... It's that we can do hard things. We can find new ways of doing and being church together, ways that allow us to live quite literally in this pandemic moment and to live more fully and freely as we discover that our old ways weren't quite as successful or universally beloved as we'd like to tell ourselves they were. But now in this moment, friends, in every moment, the Spirit is holding out her hand to us, inviting us. Shall we dance? Let's be bold and dance out our hope. Friends, if you've heard the word of God preached here today, Remember to give all honor and glory to our one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen.